Hey everyone and welcome back to another Warcraft video. Well, first, happy 9.0 week. The weight of BFA is almost off our shoulders and soon we're going to be able to start on a fresh enough adventure, which is pretty exciting. But that said, right now we're still firmly in the Shadowlands waiting room about for the next month or so. But thankfully, it's a fairly nice waiting room to be in. We have a lot of changes to go over in today's video. And first, here's a change that we believe you should make. Hit up Dashlane dot com forward slash bellular today's sponsor get 10 percent off and instantly up your internet game dashlane is my password manager of choice and basically it generates high security passwords for each and every site that you use and then it automatically logs you into those sites whenever you go to them so yeah you literally get more security and more convenience and it even integrates with like ios which i love it's super handy i'm not fumbling around with passwords on my phone which is a bit big like increase in my quality of life. But there's also more. There's of course dark web monitoring. So if you use a site and that site is compromised, they'll let you know. They've also got a VPN and they're on like every device that you use through their extensions and their apps. It is all mega secure too. Your passwords are locally decrypted using your master password. And that means that even if Dashlane was hacked, well, the hackers wouldn't be able to get your information. So honestly, it's just a massive level up to your internet usage and my code at dashlane.com forward slash bellular gets you 10% off. So big thanks to them for supporting the channel and let's get into the video. Class gameplay is the interface through which we experience, well, most of the game's content. That means it's pretty important. So, what's actually changing? Well, at a glance, most classes, I would say, are actually getting improvements, and it should be fun to check out. For basically everyone, there is utility unpruning. So that means rogue poisons, warlock curses, paladin auras, and a whole lot more. Yep, Link of the Unpruner gave almost every single class at least a few fun tools back back. Utility is still not a homogenized thing across the classes, but I would say that just about every class is a little bit better at their niche than they were before, which is quite good. Then next, Frosty Case, Fury Warriors, and Windwalker Monks got an old favorite back. Frosty Case can now hit like trucks with two-handers, and Fury Warriors can get extra damage and a bit more movement speed by making that trade-off to have dual-wielded one-handers. Then, Windwalkers... Well, they finally realized that they don't use their weapons anyway, and now they've remembered they can actually put a two-hander on their back, so that's quite good. Next, though, there's something that's fantastic for everyone, and that is the great un-GCD changing. So, the last pre-patch guide that we made had the opposite of this news, right? It had the big GCD change, and now that's being reverted in many ways. It's been a long two years, hasn't it? But basically, yes, Blizzard have went back on a huge portion of their GCD changes from the Battle for Azeroth expansion. And that means that once pre-patch hits, most of your burst damage cooldowns will be off the GCD and will once again feel nice instead of frustrating to press. This affects every class except the Demon Hunters, but I'd say the real winner are the Mages, you know, over concerns of, um, you know, high setup time. Rune of Power was actually changed to also activate with your main cooldown. So now, thanks to the GCD removal, you can pop Arcane Power, Rune of Power, and an instant Arcane Blast from Presence of Mind all in one global cooldown. And yes, that feels pretty damn good. Then, of course, there are individual class changes to cover. There are far too many to go over in this video, given its scope, but they are, I would say, mostly positive. In terms of core changes, the Shadow Priest rework, I would say, is a massive improvement for the Shadow Priests. The Enhancement Shaman is also worlds better to play, in our view, and the Affliction Warlock change actually does make it quite a bit more compelling. Almost everyone has had their talents moved around a bit, and I would say generally they do feel better, as well as some new baseline abilities to add a little bit of fun back in. Now that said, it's not all good. We do have to pour one out for the yet incomplete Windwalkers, Mistweavers, and the wholly untouched Survival Hunters. Yes, they haven't been touched. So for them, I suppose, better luck in 9.1. 
Now our final passive Shadowlands class coverage is on the way to help you pick a main and all of that stuff for the expansion, but for now pre-patch is a perfect opportunity to play around with the specs that you are interested in. Azerite powers are still active too, so you might find some fun silly little overlaps that will only really exist during pre-patch, and perhaps that will give Rex Tori something to uh, get another video out of. And on the hot topic of BFA systems, we have to cover some changes. So, corruptions. Corruptions are going away. That means if you've been playing patch 8.3, well, it's time for that cathartic clearing out of your bags, and maybe it will hit you that farming all those Aquas of Nihilotha really wasn't that important anyway. Now, you can just uh, stick your best stats on and call it a day, because corruptions are gone, and that's a promising sign of the Shadowlands gearing experience. It's not all super clear cut though, because we do actually have some stats changes under the hood. Now these are things that are coming to the game with the pre-patch, but they likely won't mean much to you until later on in Shadowlands. And the change is the stat tax. Basically, once you hit certain brackets of secondary stats from gear, those secondary stats past a certain point will lose effectiveness. The effectiveness of stats was always a bit fluid, but now it's basically a progressive taxation system. That's a very easy way to think through it if you've done your taxes before. Now, basically, once you get above 25% of a stat, there is a 10% penalty on any further points that go into that stat, and uh, that grows, that penalty, at certain brackets. And it's also impossible to get past a 106% rating from gear. Basically, this is squishing down the scaling of secondary stats as expansions progress, and it's another move to essentially push item level and primary stats over secondary stats, which is something that will simplify gearing quite a bit. Or at least it will in theory, because hey, secondary stat scaling is something that's been a bit wacky for a long time, and we'll just need to wait and see. But to quickly explain this to you, here is a simple line chart that shows you the effect of this rather quickly. So if you take a look at that, you'll basically understand how this is working. And overall, I would say to you that this will not have a massive impact until we get into the later patches of Shadowlands. And even at that point, I'd say the average player probably won't think about it much or notice it much. But certainly, if you are the type of spec that traditionally has went massively into stacking a single secondary stat on live, then perhaps things might actually change for you. Moving on from stats then, let's actually take a look at what numbers are going to look and feel like once you log in. The answer is pretty simple, they'll be a hell of a lot smaller, and that is thanks to the Squish. A character with 460,000 health on live has 18,000 on the pre-patch PTR. Abilities that were dealing 8k and 15k now deal 750 damage, or 400 damage. Basically, you'll log in, and your health and damage will be about 4-5% to of what they used to be. And also, you'll be level 50, not level 120. The level squish has been, uh, well, a long time coming, and level 60 is the new Shadowlands max level, and levels have basically been squished to make it all make a little bit more sense. Really, each level feels a bit more valuable when you're leveling up, when there's a smaller number of them, and that's kind of like a little psychological thing. Also, it does bring it back to level 60 being the end, which of course is vanilla, and it turns out, yes, you can be nostalgic for a number. And also, in our view, this gives you a bit of a cleaner view of the game when you're actually playing. Personally, I'll say, I think it's a lot nicer to have those more quick readable numbers than a big spectacle of, you know, six and seven digit figures flying about on your screen. So, there's that. The level squish and the number and stat squish. But there's also the fact that, uh, well, item levels are squished too, but also that leveling will be significantly faster thanks to the whole time walking campaign that is going on. But of course, that is something you can check out with our leveling guide, which will be giving you what we think is the fastest and most accessible way to get new characters up fast. And for a quick TLDR, you can level up to 50 with any expansion that you want to, and Blizzard have just implemented scaling across the whole world. World. And yeah, you can jump into a Legion dungeon at level 10. That might feel a bit bizarre, but there's nothing stopping you. Let's talk about things to do. We've covered thus far most of the system changes that separate 9.0 from 8.3. So that leaves us with a question. Where are the things to do? What do we do? What new or revamped activities will there be to actually pass the time until Shadowlands? Well, 
Sadly, you will have heard of the Scourge invasion, but that is in the coming weeks, so that is ruled out for now. But there is still enough to keep you occupied for a while, so don't fret. Customization is a pretty obvious one to start off with, and I think most of us will be going to the Barber once pre-patch actually hits, and that's because there's a huge wealth of customization added for non-allied races, so it is worth checking out all the new things you can do on your character. You know, new hairstyles, new colors, new facial hair, eyebrows, face shapes, new accessories, new makeup. There's a lot. It's a whole customization renaissance, basically. I mean, wargans can customize their human and wargan forms independently, and druids can pick up whatever appearances they want from the barber for each of their shapeshifts. And that even includes Fandral Staghelm's firecat form, and by the way, if you want that, then a thing you can do is start farming that boss in the Firelands raid. And of course, also your artifact appearances. That'll be a thing that you'll really want to do if you're a druid, so you get those options. Then you can also pay to change your character's gender at the barber, and I'll say this, Blizzard letting us pay gold for what used to be a paid service, that's definitely quite refreshing. And hopefully this is the sort of thing that continues to expand, because honestly, this is incredible news for so many players. Transmogification is also a big thing because, in line with all these customization changes, transmog has been opened up a bit. So, artifacts are now more moggable in a just a far more robust way across, uh, across like, well, I guess, hands and also across specs. So, basically, you can have individual artifact appearances on each hand. And that does mean, if you're a fury warrior, you can dual wield the prot paladin flails. That is cool. Shamans can use, uh, say, two elemental appearances of Doomhammer. Rat Paladins can use the Silver Hand Mace to smack down their enemies. It is some cool stuff. So yeah, it is definitely worth playing around to see what nice setups you can get going. The next is Exile's Reach, which, of course, is the new leveling place for new characters to go. It's something we recommend doing because it's a little bit of fun, it's something new. But also, uh, while, of course, the usual slew of transmog activities are available, like doing old raids and unlocking your legion stuff, there is a new one opening up, and that is Exile's Reach. This is something you will want to do. So, it's the new player experience, and basically, it offers a couple of really clean weapon appearances for completion. So, if you like having kind of less gaudy sorts of weapons, uh, you know, you want weapons with a more simplistic exp uh, sort of appearance to them, you know, there aren't shiny glowing light things, but you also don't want to have a weapon model from the early 2000s, then you've got to hit up Exile's Reach. It's also a pretty fun little experience first time too, especially if you explore it for, you know, the chests, the extra quests, and the rares. It's very much a modern Warcraft experience, a small mystery, some nice characters, and just generally well-paced questing. It's even got a little bit of that classic vibe, as each class has actually got a unique quest to, um, to do to unlock uh, one of their abilities. I definitely recommend giving it a go, and certainly if you've got friends who want to dr like try the game for the first time, Exile's Reach really does let them do that pretty well. Allied races are a big thing, so if you've been out of the game for a while, or you've never been a fan of grinding up reps, then you can get access to allied races now. This is the time to do it. The rep requirement has been removed, right? You don't need exalted reputation. All that you need to do is do the race-specific quest line to unlock them. This will basically help those uh, alliance mains who maybe want to play a Volpera on the side and haven't done the rep. Yeah, I'm sure those people exist. Okay, let's do a quick rundown for the Alliance. That is doing the 7.3 Argus questline for the Void Elves and the Lightforged Draenei of the Legion expansion. Then for the BFA stuff, it is doing the War Campaign for the Dark Iron and, of course, the Mechagon questline for the Mechanomes. Do you know what? If you haven't done those things before, you can kind of just do the content free from BFA systems, which does actually mean you'll probably have a decent time. Also, then for the Cult Tyrans, that involves getting the lore master of Kul Taras, as well as finishing the patch 8.1 war campaign and the decently lengthy saving Jaina questline, but it's all pretty solid content. Then over on the Horde side, there is the zone appropriate quests for the Nightborn and the High Mountain from Legion. BFA's content then of course nets you the Maghar Orcs for finishing the war campaign and the Valpara 
from doing the Valdun quests. The Zandalari then, like their Kul Tiran counterparts, do require you to do the patch 8.1 war campaign, um, all of Zandalar's quests for Loremaster, and then seeing, of course, the awakening of Mithrax in the Bloodgate questline. But do all that stuff and you can get your allied races. And certainly, if you haven't played since BFA or, you know, before BFA, maybe since Legion, you got put off by BFA around the start, then there's a lot of content for you to do here. Next up, mounts. So while this is not new stuff to do, Blizzard have confirmed that you still have time during the pre-patch to get Mythic Jaina and Mythic Nazoth mounts at their 100% drop rate. Now this may be harder or easier given the stat squish and the removal of corruptions. That will depend on how the raids are being scaled to deal with those things, but certainly a lot more people will be back in game for pre-patch and I imagine you'll have a decently easy time filling up groups. So yes, that would be a good way to try to get some mounts and all also to try out your class changes in a raiding environment. Then next, and uh, moving away from the core gameplay and into the economy, there is the Relics of the Past system. Now, we cover this in depth in our Professions Guide, but we'll recap here. Basically, some very old crafting recipes have got new slots added in for optional reagents, and you can actually use those slots to uh, craft them at very different level requirements and item levels, uh, ranging from level 10 through to 50. Every crafting profession can actually make and use these relics using materials from every expansion. So, if you want to be the next Rex Tori, then maybe look for a crafted item with some sort of effect and then try scaling it up to level 50 with a relic of the past. Could be bonkers. I suppose you can do that for level 10 as well. Uh, these relics can be made with almost any old crafting materials that you've got lying around the place, so um, you should be able to make a quick buck from this, either selling the relics, uh, the materials that now have got a bit more of a purpose, or perhaps that level 50 TBC crafted weapon. So that's what's up there. Now this does not seem to serve a huge amount of purpose in general, but I imagine that something funny will happen from it. So, hey, why not go see what's going on there? Next, it's a particularly good day for the Hunters because we are actually getting a whole bunch of new things to play around with. A legion of new tames are available to you from the get-go. That means camels, uh, cursors, mammoths. Uh, if you've got a character also that's exalted with the Order of the Cloud Serpents, then you can pick up a book that allows you to tame Cloud Serpents. That even includes Algalon or Algon even. That's pretty cool. You can just have him going around with you. And then if your stables are getting a bit packed, then don't worry, because the old limit of 60 is being moved up to 200. And then, as an aside, undead hunters will be able to tame some undead pets, while uh, other hunters will actually have to wait until Shadowlands launches in order to find a book to do that. Then finally, some game adjacent stuff. So you can do this stuff now with the PTR, but absolutely do not forget about your interface and your add-ons. You might want to wait until our videos are up if you want to revamp your add-ons and your UI, or maybe rethink your keybinds for your new abilities. We are doing a massive amount of work in the coming weeks for those videos on um, add-ons, keybinds, and UI setups for Shadowlands, but what I would say is you can play around with those things now. You can update some of your add-ons for the pre-patch. First things first, though, make sure to preserve your current setup. So back up your interface and your WTF folders before logging in. The last thing you want is dead weak ores or lost config strings, especially since the Shadowlands version um, of that add-on in particular has got a lot of changes under the hood. Things can and will uh, go wrong, so you will want to back those things up for sure. I think redoing any add-on profile from scratch is uh, somewhat of a nightmare, and you will want to avoid that. So to bring this video to a close, while the pre-patch doesn't have the event just yet, there certainly are a lot of things you can actually do here. There's a lot to play around with, especially if you want to spend the next few weeks leveling up some characters at breakneck speed. I mean, one thing, you know, you've got those new, more accessible allied races, and you've also got faster leveling. So if you want to get your heritage armors, well, the good news is that heritage armors are unlocked uh, at level 50, not level 60. So you can just get all your heritage armors now if you want to. And certainly not having the GCD on, you know, so many of your cooldowns, that does just mean that a whole bunch of the classes and the specs just feel so much better to play in day-to-day -day life. And man, that relief that comes in from not having to think about corruption gear ever again, man, that's really good. So, 
I'll leave you with uh, a bit of a question. What are you looking forward to with Prepatch? What are you going to be doing with it? And of course, if you want to level up your internet game, then check out Dashlane today's sponsor in the link in the description below. That is it for me. Have fun with Prepatch, and I will see you next time.